we just got done with Stand and Deliver, and we're already making waves in NXT. <laughs> we might have people not even stay in NXT by the end of April. We got a whole bunch of main roster folks like invading NXT this week, setting up some stuff, which I personally think are just short term for spring break in, in a couple of weeks. But we'll dive into that. But hi, all you sexy VC WrestlePod nerds out there, and welcome to another rendition of the Dynamic Dominance Trio review, your weekly WWE NXT review team. It is just the duo tonight, unfortunately. Our other co-host, Will, had to step out for the evening, so everything is okay. He just had to take care of some stuff. So, Will, we love you and we miss you. But joining me this evening, just coming off the fresh tregs and the trenches of what was WrestleMania weekend and, you know, getting a small room to breathe before diving back into everything, Andrew, welcome. Thank you for WrestleMania weekend, and we're back to our regular NXT. We're back to our regular scheduled programming. What's up? What's up? <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm happy to have you here because we have a lot to talk about because forget the Raw after Mania. NXT after Stand and Deliver was just as wild. Though I have a lot more questions than I did after Stand and Deliver. But... Let's just dive into everything. So just a general consensus of the night overall. We're going to break it down bit by bit. But like I said, there's a lot of folks that have been foretold that we're probably not going to be able to keep them until the end of April. So plans seem to be moving forward at a quick neck break, you know, breakneck pace, which we kind of got a little bit of this from what started off the show. Roxanne Perez, you're new. NXT Women's Champion coming down to the ring and cutting a promo. So this is note number one from Will because he did leave me some notes to say it too. He loves Roxanne, but he says that she needs to she with a little more time and a little more comfortability on the microphone. Her promo skills are going to get a little bit better, and I tend to agree a little bit. The content of the promo was fine. I just, Roxanne just needs to work on the delivery, but basically Roxanne, like everyone starts cheering for her all of a sudden. She's like, no, you don't get to say that to me because y'all were booing me for the last couple of months and I needed that a year ago. And then y'all turned on me, but I don't need it now. And she basically just drops the hint that she's like, I'm going to hold on to this thing. The only time I'm giving this up is when I get called up to main roster which is the backhanded way of saying it's like, this title means nothing to me because I'm going to be bound for bigger and better things, which then prompts <laughs> poor Lyra to come out. And this was the first instance in which this crowd kind of booed Lyra too. I was like, this is the, this is my biggest critique and I'm going to go on a quite a bit of a tangent. Like the audience that they normally get for NXT half the time, I was like, they always find a way to go into business for themselves. I'm just like, who hurt you? <laughs> like, what happened? And I get, you know, because it's a smaller venue and more local people go there, which is cool and everything. But I'm like, well, damn. I was like, I need some consistency because Lyra's the face most. And I was like, and we're booing her? Like, what happened? What What's going on? But... Lyra comes out, she berates Roxanne, and before she gets a chance to want to fight for that title and explain further, Tatum just hops out of nowhere from the barricade, pops over, tells Lyra, be like, hey, so I don't think you're ready for this. Lyra says she is, and Tatum's like, are you though? And she attacks Lyra by throwing her into the stairs. I'm like, well, I got that one wrong on my bingo card of who was going to turn on who. Which then Roxanne basically says well i guess there's no match ava well natalia then comes out this is a long segment so bear with me natalia comes out she wants a championship match roxanne says no ava comes out and says um well we're gonna do it anyways roxanne tries to blindside natalia natalia attacks back roxanne gets out of the ring leaving the title and that is how we open up nxt in the first eh, 10 minutes or so there is a lot <laughs> Yeah, uh, I gotta agree with Will on this. Uh, 
uh, Roxanne's promo felt like an audition monologue. Um, it it was really weird how she hit a lot of the points, um, how she delivered some of the stuff, and it's unfortunate because the fa- the the audience was behind her a lot of the time. Like there were some people booing her, but the majority of them were cheering for her. Um, and it was coming out of those moments that like you could see there was like she had that energy from them but it was almost like she had that and then she was like oh no i have to go back to my lines and so i don't know if that's because of how strict that they are with like what she tells or if she just doesn't have the performance experience to be able to kind of flow freely like some more experienced performers do um and it was interesting because we got it later on in the night when she showed up uh, that the fans were cheering for her again and rooting for her. Uh, and when Lyra showed up, yeah, the first thing they started cheering was you tapped out. Like, um, So it's one of those situations, and we've seen this in the past before, where they're like, this is the heel. This is the character you're going to hate. And the fans are behind them. And they're like, this is the hero. This is the face. This is the one you're going to cheer for. And they don't. Um so it generally doesn't work too well when you try to push too hard against that. You you gotta you gotta figure out a way to organically go with what the fans are wanting to do. Um, yeah, I was I was surprised but happy that Tatum finally turned, and I kind of like the way that it happened because Lyra was kind of from a desperation point wanting to. Uh, like, you know, she was almost trying to convince Tatum that she could do this and Tatum kind of, it was almost like she saw the person she looked up to who kind of fell from grace. And so it was like her moving out of that shadow. Um, so that was all I, I like the story and where we're going with that. So I'm interested to see if we're going to see, you know, Tatum versus Lyra or what's going to happen. I feel like Once this is all done, this might be a chance to push Tatum up into, like, her own spotlight. Uh, I really like the character that she plays. She's kind of an amalgamation of a few previous performers that we've had. Um, Natalia coming out just did not do it for me. Um, I was not thrilled when she came out to face Lola Vice. I have not been enjoying this Canadian connection she's got going on. I'm just not invested in it. I feel like it's a... Natalia, you're not doing. We're not going to do anything with you on the main roster. So, because of your family and the history that you've had as a professional wrestler, we'll send you down there to NXT, and we'll like you know give you some stuff down there because it's like a consolation thing. Um, and I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here that may be an unpopular opinion. I don't particularly care for GM Ava. Um, and I, I, this, this is not anything to do with her real life situation, but when she comes out, she seems like someone's kid whose parents left them in charge. Uh, and she just doesn't come across with any authority. And I felt that way before her actual parent became in charge of things. Um, it just, there's something about it that just doesn't click for me as her, as an authority figure. Um, I, the way that she's being presented is being presented in this way that you would present someone like William Regal or someone like that. That's got that like history and strength and those things to them. Um, and she comes across much younger, much less experienced, much less like presence. Um, and I think there's ways that they could present her as a GM, um, that might come across better, but it just doesn't click for me. I just don't enjoy it. It just, I, I just don't buy it most of the time that I see it. So it, it just kind of, everything about the end of this segment just kind of took it away from me. I wasn't excited, and I was particularly not excited about um, the match that got set up from this. What happened, Andrew? Don't you like the boat, <laughs> Natalia? <laughs> no, no, no. That that boat sailed for me a long time ago. <laughs> I hate that acronym for Natalia. I hate that that's what yeah. they're using, but we'll talk more about that match a little bit later. So whoever NXT Anonymous is deserves a raise because they be getting the, you know, behind the scenes stuff that you're not supposed to know about. But we get a clip from NXT Anonymous with Nathan and Axiom talking to Ava after their match at Stand and Deliver, which, you know, when we got when I got so 
I get an email a couple hours before NXT goes live. Be like, here's what you can expect on NXT. And I looked on it. It's like, we're getting a tag team championship match. And I looked at who was competing. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> I was like, I mean, I'm not going to complain because the stand and deliver match was really, really good. But how? Why? What? And which leads into the backstage segment where Nathan Frazier and Axiom are talking about like, we were so close and we know that we can beat them, but this is going to be our last opportunity. And basically Axiom states that, you know, if we don't win this, we got to go our separate ways. And Nathan agrees. I'm like, oh, so you just, you just told me they're going to win, aren't they? I'm like, way to sell it, NXT. Because nine out of 10 times if a team says this is our last chance and we're going to split up if we don't win, I'm like, you're just, you're going to win, aren't you? I'm like, gee, thanks, NXT, for telling me that they're going to win, which made me very sad. And Will needs Axiom to stop turning away from the microphone. <laughs> yeah, this was this was kind of obvious the, between the anonymous promo, this setup, um, you know, the draft coming up, all this kind of stuff. Braun, you know, signing to SmackDown. Um, if they were facing a different tag team, I might have been like, okay, this is a chance that they're going to go one of two ways. Either Axiom and Frazier are becoming the tag team champions, or they're getting called up. But between those two tag teams, the likelihood of who's getting called up or going back or whatever you want to call it, is not Axiom and Nathan Frazier. So it was like, cool, you just told us the uh, end of the book in the introduction. Thanks. I'm just like, way to go, NXT. You ruined it for me. So, because I knew this was probably going to mean that Velocity, our little team, <laughs> was going to win, I was filled with sadness for the rest of the evening. I will say, um, something got me excited, and I know it's silly because we do this stuff, but, um, you know, calling them Velocity. In the promo, yep. it didn't happen in the match, but in the promo, Axiom's mask was green and gold. And I was like, oh my god, that's Velocity Colors. <laughs> like, I was like, please let them go down that route. I swear they're listening. They're <laughs> listening. Some, an intern or somebody is yeah. listening to this. <laughs> so, oh in creative, god. they're like, We're, you're coming up with all these great ideas. Wow, how'd you think of this? Like, I don't know, it just came to me. Meanwhile, they're listening to our podcast. They're like sliding, they're sliding the yeah. computer away, hiding the fact that they're on this YouTube channel. <laughs> Listen, it's okay if you take our ideas. All we ask in return is you give us tickets to go see NXT taping. And, you know, let us let us help you book for a week. We would love to do everything. I will help your writers. Andrew will help with stage combat. And Will will help with promos. <laughs> like, honestly. I'm not saying no. But, yeah, so as soon as I, this backstage segment ended... And I was filled with sadness and glee and more sadness. Okay. Speaking of glee. Speaking of glee. So we go to the booth, <laughs> we we go to the wish version of glee. I'm just kidding. So no, we get yeah, a no. chase we get a chase you segment where Fallon and Kalani are given like honorary <sighs> certificates for helping out with the uh, at stand and deliver. And so Thea comes in all excited because she's a little bit late. Ceremony is happening. And then JC Jane drops in and homegirl drops a bombshell. I'm like, but is it though? And then I had to go back of what, and then I listened to what she said. So before I like call shenanigans on this, but JC basically says that Thea, you want to know why the reason that JC was such in debt? Here's why. So back at the great American bash last year in July, Mr. Chase here made a big wager on you. And he bet that you were going to win the NXT Women's Championship against Tiffany. I'm like, oh yeah, that was a match that happened. <laughs> and so, but he threw in the towel and he lost. So therefore, he lost a lot of money. So I bailed him out because I wanted to. And guess what, Thea? This is all your fault. The reason that Chase University went under is all on you. And so... The whole entire time, Andre Chase is trying to stop JC from saying anything. And then he reassures Thea. It's just like, if I had to choose between the college and you, Thea, it's you all the time. Thea gets angry. She storms off. And JC got the win column in this little interaction by playing the my emotional mind game here. 
And I'm like, oh, Thea's going to whoop that butt <laughs> as soon as she can. And I, so I thought about this. I sat with it. I was like, okay, this was kind of melodramatic, but I'm here for it. And then I was in the middle of trying to fall asleep last night. And then like Epiphany hit me. I'm like, hold up. Wait a minute. And so then I, this morning, I went back and watched the match at Great America Bash. I'm like, hold up. JC failed to omit certain things. That is not how the way it played out. I'm like, way to ruin continuity, NXT, because that's not how that match ended up. Thea technically had the win, but Andre Chase was talking to the referee, which is what not what happened and what not JC did not mention in her whole thing. I was like, you just lied to me, NXT. I was like, you didn't think I was going to go back and watch, but I did. That is not how the tr events transpired. I'm like, I see what you did. I'm not a casual. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because hearing that, you know, I wasn't watching NXT at that point. Uh, it, it's during my downtime from NXT. It sounds like it's more of Andre Chase's fault than anybody else's fault. He right? Made, I was like, hold he, up, what? He made the bet. He apparently distracted the referee. And then you say he threw in the towel. So all three of those things were he, things he chose to do. And so, like, yeah, I mean, and maybe that's, you know, playing into Thea's naivete and youth and all that kind of stuff. But at some point, I hope she points this out. Like, you know, honestly, um, I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of this version of Saved by the Bell, but um, I, I would like if this would be a split from Thea from Chase U, because... I've been liking what she's been doing since she started going back into this old Thea and like the aggression that she's had. And I've actually really been enjoying her with um, Fallon and uh, Kalani. Um, and so I wouldn't mind if she stepped away from Chase U and a chance for her to do that would be her to go back and look at some of that stuff, take a minute to realize and go, wait a minute, this isn't my fault. I didn't do any of this stuff. Like, you did it all and you're the leader and you're the person in charge of the school and you're like so like this is all not on her um so yeah this but for me yeah this was this was pretty this was pretty cheesy for me and not not to as you know the kids used to say yuck or yum or anything but um this is not it's just i don't it's too much suspension of my disbelief to enjoy this these promos i get it. some people enjoy it and that's fine and everything but I'm, I'm hoping that we get something more substantial out of this especially because the three women um that are involved heck even the you know the other the five the two that are kind of the heels um are really 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 good so i want to see more from them yeah, I really do too. And I do appreciate that that seems the direction that we're going to be headed with JC and Thea going one on one. And then it seems we might be going back and forth with, you know, the mean girls and then Fallon and Kalani, which, you know, that's actually what happens next. So, you know, it's we get this whole ceremony and then we immediately go to Kalani and Fallon. Like, in their ring gear, ready to go. I was like, oh, so that was definitely pre-taped. But uh, we get our next match of the evening. This is a tag team match. Already in the ring, we have the mean girls of Kiana James and Izzy Dame taking on our lovely heroines Fallon Henley and Kalani Jordan. Once again, I thought this match was a lot of fun. Fallon, again, has improved so much over the last year. It's been nice to see that baseball slide to Kiana. Yes. Was so devastatingly, like, looking i was like oh my gosh i think she kicked her in the face good i'm just kidding <laughs> i also got to give credit to kiana kiana's another one who also has improved so much like i'm like oh girl we're pulling up new moves okay let's go kalani continues to be amazing using her gymnastic background to do flips and tricks and things like that I really liked the finishing sequence in which they were going after Kalani and Fallon like literally dope, pushed her out of the way to take the hit. And unfortunately, Fallon does get pinned, but it was to keep Kalani from getting pinned, which is nice because we've been fighting this feud with Kiana and Kalani since Vengeance Day when Kiana cut that pre-tape promo 
that, oh, Kalani's at the top of the women's division. We need to knock her off her pedestal so I can be at the top of the women's division. I'm like, are we sure that's still the plot that we're going with? Because I feel like there's also a couple of other women certainly climbing up to that spot. <laughs> yeah, this, this match was awesome. I really enjoyed this match. I thought it was a great tag match. This was another match that I'm like, please, please bring that women's tag team title into nxt more often because uh the mean girls club like their power combos like the two of them together were just so good they're such a good tag team i really enjoy them um if you're gonna keep them together with the other two um make them a stable make them a four woman stable have them go after all four titles you got two you got a tag team you got one that could go after the women's title one that can go after north american title um you know, um, and the showing from uh, Jordan and Henley was really good. That that combo where um, uh, uh, Fallon hit the baseball slide and then Kalani did the like um, slingshot corkscrew over the top rope was amazing. Um, I don't know why I'm a really big fan of the tornado suplex and Fallon hit one of those in the match, which was really cool. Um like I said, uh, the Mean Girls Club's a really good tag team. Uh, it was a great tag team match, and I like that the faces lost doing face things of, you know, Fallon trying to save her partner, but doing it in a, a problematic way, being the legal person, taking the shot, and then getting pinned. Because um, <clears throat> it makes sense. You know, you're a good person. You're, uh, you know... Uh, the hero in this, you're going to try and protect your friend at all costs. Um, and that's not a mistake that the heels are going to make. So I like the storytelling aspect of that too. This was definitely a good way to start off the matches of the night. The women killed at this match. This yeah. is a fun one. And, you know, I will say a lot of the women's matches tonight were varying degrees, but I think they were still solid. And this was a really good one. All right, so I'm going to do the thing that, you know, Andrew does with his notes. So I'm going to try to replicate this because NXT did this thing that I hate absolutely. We get an entrance, and then we get a backstage promo, and then we get a second entrance because this mm. is what happens. So as soon as this match is over, we cut backstage with all of OTM. We find out that Scripps and Jada Parker are going to be in matches tonight. So they're going to try to bring wins to OTM. And so then it was time to go. So we get a continuous backstage shot from Gorilla to the entrance of NXT where Scripps makes his entrance. And then we cut backstage with no quarter catch crew minus a Drew Gulag. May or may not allegedly have to do with what has come out recently with the accusation that a certain former wrestler of the company said in her tell-all book. That's a whole can of worms. That's another podcast. We could talk about that. But it was just Charlie Dempsey, Miles My Bourne, and Damon Kemp talking about it. They mentioned GCW Bloodsport, which was crazy to hear on NXT television. And apparently they have some sort of deal with the Don of Tony D'Angelo. I'm like, since when? I'm like, hold up. Where was that? Which then prompts the rest of the family to come out. So this is Mr. Crucifino, Stax, and miss rizzo they all come out they talk to no quarter catch crew that you know tony is on vacation but when he comes back they'll deal with it no quarter catch crew doesn't like being lied to the family's like all right we'll take care of business tonight which sets up a match later tonight okay <laughs> sure that's fine and then we get back to the ring and then we have the entrant of making his nxt television debut a one 19 year old javon evans and Look, I'm gonna I'm just put this I'm gonna put this right here. I have seen some takes. People are like, he flies too high. Nah, forget that. I'm like, I don't care if he does flippy things. That is what I like in my wrestling. That is my favorite style of wrestling. Obviously, it's probably gonna happen. I need a Javon Evans versus a Wesley match when they come back. Like, oh my gosh. Or how about but, Javon Evans versus Ricochet? Yes, that just Javon Evans versus any of our high flyers in NXT and on the main roster, too. He is 19, Andrew. Holy crap. That jump rope cutter, the, the height that he got on that thing, that is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. 
Though I also got to give credit to Scripps too because he yeah. held his own in this one. Mm-hmm. It was a nice back and forth. It was a seven minute match. I wish we got like ten minutes of this thing, but I love that hit, oh, Javon Evans' whole catchphrase is like he's about to make it bouncy, which I really really enjoy. Like the match itself was fun, but I'm gonna mm-hmm. let you talk because I want to talk together about the finisher because I swear to God the kid defied all laws of physics and gravity with that thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, this this guy is crazy. Um, and it's crazy that he's 19 because he is a very lean wrestler. So in the next, you know, five years, he's going to put on some muscle mass, even if he doesn't get super big, especially for his style. But once he starts to fill out, really get into that like 25 year old range, his athleticism, he's going to be insane. Like this, this guy is great. And they brought it up in commentary. His personality already is so infectious. He's just so happy. Um, you know, as my wife would say, he's kind of a golden retriever. Like, you just, <laughs> you just see him and you see that smile and you just can't help but smile. Um, I want good things for this kid after yeah. this match. I'm like, he's so genuine. And, mm-hmm. you know, I believe the story that commentary yeah. said is, is like, he fell in love with wrestling thanks to his grandma. He wished his grandma was here, and that kind of hit home for me because I felt the similar situation during lockdown with my grandma being my wrestling person. I want good things for this kid. Yeah. And I also agree that Scripps looked really good in this. You know, it's it's always nice to see when you've got these performers who uh, most of the time play kind of management roles or, um, like, they're the comedic relief jobber type character Mm -hmm. and then they actually get to show what they can do and remind you that they're actually really skilled um so i thought this was a really good showcase for evan's debut but it was also a really good showing for scripts showing what he could do the fact that he could keep up with this you know 19 year old prodigy kind of kid um yeah i agree the oz cutter that he does is insane i mean he basically goes straight up and straight back down um kind of and it's funny that they show up later there was a part of me when i saw him come down his entrance there was a part of me that was like i kind of want to see him hanging around with anofi blade and reese um he's got got that similar energy uh but yeah i'm super excited to see what this kid does in his entire professional career um so i I agree i hope i hope the best for for him and i'm excited to be able to watch it I'm going to be honest, this was probably my top two match of the evening just because yep. of I saw his matches on Level Up and it's nice that, you know, NXT put him on television mm-hmm. and they believe in him. But yeah, that finisher, Andrew, when he goes to the top, I was like, oh, okay, corkscrew. And then like halfway down, he a switch flips where he just and then goes yeah. in. I'm like, how do you physically do that? Like, what? Like, yeah. how do you ro- you you twist yourself off the top? then halfway before you hit your target, you no assist, no nothing, but you rotate yourself mm-hmm. quickly to get there. I'm like, how do you physically do that? Yeah. <laughs> like, that blew my mind. Yeah, and I have a feeling we're going to see more stuff from him, especially once he start, when like he's against a powerhouse who can, like, you know, basically base him for a lot of crazy moves um, or in a match against another really big high flyer. Uh, this, I think he's got more in his arsenal that we haven't seen. And as he learns more, he's, he's going to show us some really crazy things. Oh, I'm so excited. I also appreciate that they didn't do the dumb baby face thing. Cause as soon as he won the match, he's like, Nope, I'm bouncing out of here. <laughs> yeah, Bye. That was so good. I love he it. He was beat like, up by nope. the heels. He's like, Nope, I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Um, which worked well, really well with OTM too. Cause obviously they're two big dudes. Um, and he just shot between them and was just like, out of there, super smart. Um, and and this was also, this tied, th- I had three matches that I gave the same ranking to, and this was tied with those other matches. Oh, absolutely. This was a fun match for both Scripps and Javon Evans. This was super good. All right. So now let's go down the rabbit hole with this next thing. Oh, Andrew, I feel your pain. So... I feel like we've lost the plot of this whole yes. entire segment with Rich Holland. So we cut back to we cut to a segment that happened earlier in the day, where you know Mackenzie, not Mackenzie, uh, our <laughs> backstage correspondent is getting her makeup done and practicing everything, and then she sees Rich is like Rich. So I was happy to see you do like the pre-show panel, but 
are you retired now because you attacked Gacy? Like, what's the situation with all of that? And I'm like, you know what backstage corresponded? I have that exact same question. And Rich did not answer it for me either. Nope. He was like, you know, I don't know what happened. Just Gacy gets on my nerves, but I do owe an apology. And the whole entire time he's talking, you see Gacy poke his head out of the curtain and <laughs> just watch this whole thing. And then I'm like... I was like, okay, this is kind of funny. And then Gacy spoke. I was like, hold up. I was like, yeah, Ridge. I was just like, you know what? It's okay, man. I understand that you're frustrated because you keep getting on the losing streak. You keep losing yourself. Like, you're not great at this. I was like, hold the phone, Gacy. What are we doing all of a sudden? You're giving, like, you're complimenting him, but then you're also taking dicks at him. I was just like, what is happening? And Ridge is like, you know what, bro? I can't deal with this. He's crazy. Like, I'm out of here. So then the camera follows into the backstage and randomly LWO are there. So Cruz Del Toro and Joaquin Wilde are right there. And they're like, yo, man, we know the Ridge Holland who destroyed people on SmackDown. Because I forgot. I was like, oh, yeah, Ridge was a team with Pete Dunne and destroyed the tag team division. So it was, hasn't been that long, but oh, yeah, I forgot about it. And so Ridge is like, you know what? I'm out of here. So as they try to go chase him. Ridge accidentally slams the door on one of the LWO's hand. And I'm just like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know what happened here. We lost the plot real hard. Yeah. Like, this was the so odd. The emotional whiplash. You made yeah. me feel bad a couple weeks ago when he retired in the ring. Yeah. And now that we've turned this into a funny storyline. I'm like, uh, what? It was so awkward. Like, the whole promo just, across the board, everybody's, the way they delivered their lines, the transition from the beginning with the makeup chair into getting Ridge, Joe Gacy, then LWO, like, it almost felt like they just sent LWO out there, and they're like, oh, here comes Ridge, say a couple say some, say a couple things to him, uh, and then him slamming his hand in the door, and all that kind of stuff, it was just no one seemed comfortable or knew their lines really and all of this really has started because of sean spears and where's sean spears nowhere to be found <laughs> so I, yeah oof. i they went the really wrong way with all of this um i'm hoping that we can get a course correction but when this started with sean spears and he started with uh, Rich Holland, that seemed like it could be a really cool thing. Getting Joe Gacy involved on paper seems like a really cool idea, especially with those two, if they went down the right path. But this is... Unless we're going to get some setup with... Happening with Spears influencing Gacy and Ridge and, you know, doing something with them and just manipulating them all and all that. I just don't know. This was just super weird and not only did it not need to happen, it actually took away from stuff from the night. Yeah, this was really weird. And Will's like, I like G Gacy, but we lost the plot with Rich. I'm like, I feel you on that one. So then we get our NXT Women's Championship match. The Boat, Natalia taking on Roxanne Perez. Okay, I wanted this match to be good. I thought it was okay. I feel that Roxanne and Natalia are very two different styles of wrestling. And they try to make it work, but it kind of reminds me of a group project that you give students and you can definitely tell like who. So there was one thought process that they wanted the project to look at the end of it. And then there was a second one. So they came to a compromise, but the compromise was not the great in final execution. So it's like half baked kind of realized, but not fully realized. That's how I felt about this match. I feel like it was somewhat realized, but not fully realized. And what kind of also took me out of it is when, spoiler alert, when Lola Vice came out to cost yeah. Natalia the match, Natalia did not sell that kick from Lola very, very well. I'm like, ma'am, you did not go down the way I thought you were going to. That is not how you sell a kick. And I was just like, I thought this was an okay match, but I'm like, I do not dislike Natalia. I think what she, I've been saying this and the rest of the boys have been saying this, let her be a heel. Let her have a stable called the Heart Dungeon where she just trains these girls and being submission experts, which I think Natalia does very, very well. 
I don't like when she tries to do the hybrid stuff. Just let her be the submission expert. But this was a half-baked match, and I, was th I thought this was okay. Yeah, this was actually my lowest-ranked match of the night. It was, Yikes. at best, like a C for me. Um, problem was, I went into this not wanting this. Like, I don't care, nor do I want to see Natalia wrestle for the NXT title. They've done no build-up to have me care anything about it. They basically... I get it. It's a chance for Roxanne to pick up a victory um, over Natalia coming out of her match from Stand and Deliver. I know she had a match on Raw, but it felt obvious who was going to win. It felt unneeded. Uh, the only thing it may have done was continued this feud with Natalia and the Canadian connection against Lola Vice, which it didn't even really do that much for me. It didn't make me that excited. Um, and the worst part is it the fact that Lola Vice got involved took away from the win that Roxanne got. So it also made Roxanne as your champion look bad, who just tapped out Lyra Valkyria. Like, I mean, it was it just this whole match across the board just bummed me out. Yeah, it did. So the next two back from this match, we get two backstage segments that had emotional whiplash for me. Cause it went, it made me sad, and then it made me very non enthusiastic. So the first part is we get a backstage segment with the Wolf Dogs, and I was like, oh my gosh, they're gonna lose, and I'm not ready for them to lose. I was like, you made me actually like this tag team NXT. How dare you? I hate you. <laughs> But this was a funny backstage segment because they're going back and forth. It's like, uh, Baron starts it off as like, uh, you want to know what the common denominator is, Braun? It's me. Because of me, we won that match. And then Baron's like, come on, you like hanging out with me. And Braun's like, no, I hate you. And he's like, come on, dude. And then Braun walks out and then comes back. And is like, I'm just kidding with you. And he's like, don't touch me. <laughs> I, I was very happy. I laughed, but I was also still very sad when I watched this. I'm like, mm. Yeah, no matter what, like, I don't want them to split these two up. They're just so good together. Even if it's, even if, I mean, I would love for them to get pushed up to, you know, SmackDown or whatever and be a tag team because I hate the fact that they treat tag team as like a secondary title and it shouldn't be a secondary title because tag team wrestling takes very specific skills that are different than singles wrestling. So in reality, the world tag team title should be the same level as the world title because you're the top of a specific division of the sport. And having someone like the Wolf Dogs would show that you're putting that in there, especially with how big they are around uh, Braun Breaker. Uh, and you can still, we've had plenty of tag team wrestlers get singles titles too. Splitting them up would be such a bummer because they've done so much, not only in ring well together, but just organically picked up fans. And that shirt is awesome. I love that I shirt. I want it so bad. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna make a list because we're gonna we all need to get the BC Wrestling Pod boys. Like we're we're gonna get these shirts together to wear on these streams, <laughs> on these reviews. I enjoyed this promo. It made me sad. I'm hoping that when the draft happens, because spoiler alert, we are getting a draft. I want to... Braun's already signed to SmackDown. I hope we get Baron moved to SmackDown too, because at least for a little bit, I want them to continue to have them as a tag team, or at least yeah. still be friends when they get to yeah. SmackDown if they're going to be doing different things. Yeah, let we Baron go from support... Me, yeah. You know, let Baron <laughs> support Braun as Braun starts to move up. Like, Baron knows what that's like. He was at the top for a little while, so. We'll talk about the unaired, like, promo that Braun yeah. made after when we get after our tag team championship match because it made me tear up a little bit on the social media. So I'm like, oh my God. I was like, you can't hate Braun after that. I was like, he truly is grateful. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. We go from me feeling sad to me feeling indifferent because at first I was like, yo, Lola's kind of cutting up in this promo. She's like, I'm going to beat a girl. I'm going to fight you. And then Natalia comes in. I was like, yo, but Natalia's kind of also like fighting pretty well too. She literally jumps Lola and she continues to punch her in the face. She's like, pff, pff, 
I was like, Natty, where is this? I was like, I need you to legit punch girls in the face now. Just up. She's grabbing hair. I was like, I'm not saying this is how women should fight, but I do like when we fight dirty and Natalia's pulling hair. She's like holding it and fighting. I was like, see Natalia, if you could be like this more in the ring than what we're being presented with, I kind of might get behind you a little bit more. But I was just like, okay, we're continuing this feud, but I don't really care. It's, I'm pretty sure we're getting a match at one of the two nights of spring break in between these two. But we'll see what happens with that. Nope. Then, okay. So this was the other match I didn't really care for. We got another tag team match. No Court Catch Crew versus The Family. At first I was like, Karrion Cross, is that you? Oh, no, wait, that's Crucifino with his hair down. I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, you look totally different. <laughs> I was like... What happened to the vest? I thought you wrestled with the vest. I was like, where's my consistency? I thought this match was okay. I was just like, hmm, it doesn't really suit anything. And Will, to me, said it best. He's just like, I feel that we're just giving the family something to do because it feels like we kind of lo they lost everything at this point. I'm like, you're kind of right. I was like, they lost the tag team championships. Tony failed to get the NXT champion. So we're kind of starting at ground zero with them again. And they just so happen to be fighting the other faction that hasn't gone nowhere either. Yeah. I thought this was okay. Yeah, it was a it was a fun enough tag team match. Um I do enjoy seeing factions face off. Um so it was nice to be remembered that we have a couple of them. Uh I wonder if we'll see more of this or if this was just like a one and done. Uh if Drew Gulak is off dealing with other things. Technically, we do have a three-on-three three that, you know, we do have between the two factions. Um, and this wouldn't be a horrible way to reboost the family. Um, but yeah, I hope they do more with both groups, especially because No Quarter Catch Crew has the Heritage Cup Championship as well. Um, so, you know, bring that out. Hell, I, I, at this point, would even be happy if the Dom comes back and is like, oh, you messed with us while I was gone. Why don't you put that title on the line and give him the Heritage Cup title for a little while or something. Do some build more things um, or let's just let this be done and move on with it. But if we're going to have factions and groups like that, it is nice to see them go up against each other instead of just like, oh, there's four of us. So we're going to go after this single person, uh, especially when they're trying to like vie for being the most dangerous or the most powerful or whatever group in their promotion let them let them face off against each other every once in a while oh yeah it yeah i'm just like this is an okay match for me but i do agree with you that i was like you know what if this means we get more faction on faction warfare and nxt i'm okay with that because lord knows we both know that mr papa h hall of Beck, aka triple h loves a good faction on faction warfare and plus, Shawn Michaels is his right hand, so DX was a huge successful faction, so there's something there to be said for that. We then get our next in-ring promo from your NXT North American champion, Oba Femi. The whole, all the Oba feminists were out and about yeah. for this one, because every after every other word, they're like, who? I was just like, I wanted to hate it at first, but now I'm sitting here on my couch doing it, and I'm like, damn it, they got me, they got to me. I'm like, save me from this. But Oba Femi is just like, I knew I was gonna def I was gonna walk out of stand and deliver with that title. And I was like, you know what, Oba, we also did too, but that match was still banging though. I was just like, and then we come to find out later, kind of spoiler alert, that Josh may have two crack ribs after that. I'm like, oh my gosh, if that's true, that's gnarly. No. But then I think about the match we saw, I was like, no, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> just one of those guys landing on you could do it. I was like, oh, I'm gonna crack into stuff. But Oba Femi is just like, basically, I've beaten a lot, almost everyone here. I was like, you're not wrong. You've kind of beaten all the big people right now. So who's left? And then the lights go dim and we get the Viking horns of the, you know, of the Viking Raiders. It's the Viking experience. <laughs> we don't talk about those days. <laughs> but who should come out? But Ivar. And I was like, holy crap. I'm used to seeing you in your Viking gear. But you coming out in jeans is crazy to me. I'm like, mm -hmm. I was like, who is this man? 
But and then Ivar started talking. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot. There's a reason I don't like you on the mic. Now I remember why. <laughs> you know, no shade to Ivar, but, you know, he got across what needed to be said. I just wish the delivery was a little bit better. I did appreciate, though, how this ended because Oba Femi tries to walk away. Ivar literally stops him in his tracks. Oba tries to go for Ivar, and Ivar does his big man, but can also fly across the ring things. And is the only person to lay, have laid out Oba Femi the way he did. Ivar grabs the title and it stands above Oba with that title to end the segment. I was just like, okay. We know Oba's going to win, but am I excited for this big meat slapping match? Hell to the yes. And so were all the fans, because as soon as Ivar came down, that's all they were chanting was meat. meat. Um, <laughs> yeah. The fans know what's up. <laughs> I mean, Ivar coming out, it's more main roster people coming into NXT. Um, I don't outright have a problem with it as long as it's done because of what those titles meant. Like Ivar kind of hinted at it. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be nice, and there was some stuff that happened later, too, that kind of made me feel this way. Is like, let's have NXT titles mean something now, because there are so many people, like, you know, years ago, they were titles that had no history. Now the titles have history. People who have held these titles have are people who are also world champions at Raw and SmackDown, um, you know, tag just, team champions, yeah, women's champions. You, you have Pete Dunne, Johnny Gargano. Finn Balor, like the four horsewomen. Um, Damian Priest was yeah. her, like one of the big North American championships, like Bronson Reed. Yeah. And then when you look at the women, Rhea, Io, Raquel, like the list just goes on yeah. and on. Shayna, like Shayna, um, Asuka. You know, oh, God, I'm so, so mad about the streak ending. There's so many people, like there's so much history now behind these titles. And the company that it's like these titles mean something so if they're going to bring people over from the main roster to be like hey i want a shot at that north american title because i can't win that up on these shows but i can win it here and that title means something um that's a really cool way to start bringing up nxt to matter more instead of feeling like oh i'm in the major leagues i don't want to drop down to triple a and play a team down there um but this could be really cool as long as they do it right. It should be Oba overcoming his biggest challenge, someone who really challenges him for power and for speed um, and, you know, uh, has a bit more grit and experience. Um, I want to see Oba Femi come out of this having faced someone in a war, a better war than he got from two other guys, uh, but come out victorious. Because that's mm -hmm. going to make Oba look that much better, uh, especially if the talk about them seeing him as a future world champion outside of NXT is true, then this is the way you build someone like that. Uh, so I just hope that they do it right. Um, and I get this is an easy way to have him face someone if you don't have anyone in your current NXT roster. Um, so yeah, I just hope they handle it right and with respect. Yeah, I think the match is going to be fun. And um, I'm still holding out hope that Wesley is the one to come back to dethrone Oba. I can dream, darn it. Okay. So speaking of dreaming, Metaphor is on cloud nine because we see them backstage. They talked about how great they were at hosting Stand and Deliver. I was like, y'all, I don't think we watched the same show, but that's okay. Because you guys kind of did backstage interviews for some of it. And then you guys kind of got lost in the shuffle. And we didn't see you until you said the numbers thing. But what I found very interesting is that Lash, Jakari, Jakara, and Noam were all cool with what happened, and Oromenso was just looking sour the whole entire time. And when asked why, Oro was basically said, it's like, you know, we got to take ourselves more seriously. I want to start winning championships. So I'm going to be, I'm going to go challenge Oba Femi, and I'm going to take that title. And then they all just looked at him like, say what now? And then Oba tells them, what, you don't think I could do it? And they lied as friends. They're like, no, we, you yeah, know, they didn't. I was just like, okay, so this is fine. Q, Dijak, for some reason, coming into the room, he lets Metaphor know that he didn't appreciate them doing the skit in his basement. And no one's like, bro, that was my idea. If you're going to be mad at someone, be mad at me. But I'm like, lighten up. Stop being so 
dark and gloomy about it. And basically, Dijek tells no one in the rest of Metaphoros is like, everyone only gets one morning. Anything after that, it's on you. And so basically, that's set, this is setting this sets up a match between Noam and Dijek next week, just because I'm like, okay, huh? <laughs> yeah, and it it's kind of a bummer that like Noam went for being the Heritage Cup champion to. I feel like he's just going to be someone that gets squashed by Dijak. Um uh, and. I, it, it's the problem I don't like of either, but I was yeah. like, "This is where we're throwing him next." Yeah, no, and it's they just they're like, it's so weird because it's so weird because like it's almost like they're not succeeding with him in the stories they're putting him in, so they just keep throwing him into the next one. They're, it's that's the throwing the spaghetti against the wall to see if it sticks kind of thing. Um, and it's not, it's not working. Uh, I, this was not, if you give me a list of 10 people to put against metaphor and have something go on, Dijak would be at number 11 for me. (coughs) Yeah. I'm just like, honestly, and I can say this, I really think that the best feud that Dijak has been in, in NXT, honestly, even though there were very shades of colonization and other like implications just because of the imager we got i honestly think that dijack and eddie thorpe's feud has probably been his best feud leading into this whole entire thing now granted the eddie thorpe and dijack feud predates andrew from joining us here at the ddt reviews but honestly that's probably been dijack's view but i'm just like poor noam dar i really like noam i was like i want better for him and I want better for the, our Heritage Cup championship, too, because, like, Charlie Dempsey, to me, on paper, makes sense. But we really haven't done much with that championship. And I'm like, has, this literally has become the 24-7 championship thing, where it's just sitting there looking pretty. There I said it, Internet, fight me. <laughs> it's not even the 24-7 championship, because that thing was all the pl- everywhere all the time, which got super irritating, because it just was got to the point where it's just so ridiculous it didn't matter. This is nowhere to be found. They've defended it once, and now it's that's it. It's not. Uh, let's move on. So we get in our next women's match of the evening. Miss Jada Parker taking on Brinley Reese. First and foremost, I love that Brinley is still with interest in Malik. Mm-hmm. That is a faction I think needs more love and screen time because they're fantastic. Yeah. I thought this was a really fun match. My biggest critique is Jada has a new finisher. I'm like, this is like the fourth finisher we have seen. And I love Jada's look. I love her attitude. I love her aesthetic. However, how is it that she has a new finisher every time she has a match? And for me personally, it progressively gets worse and worse. I don't like this finisher she pulled out tonight. And I'm like, Jada, what is going on? I 100% agree. That was one of the notes that I had too. Was I do not like that finisher. Um, it, I mean, it's basically you know a rear view, but less so. It's like a side view, um, and it just doesn't come across impactful enough to be a finisher. Uh, you know, maybe if it's a setup for a finisher or something. But yeah, it just it it was the dip for me, which it wasn't horrible. It didn't make me dislike this match i thought this match was a really solid match um i was really happy to see both of them in action uh because we've seen a lot backstage from both of them um so to see them both uh, you know live this week in action against each other um, i thought they also both look really skilled and strong um, which was great it was cool to see that side of brindley reese like see her in there against someone who was another powerhouse like jada parker um i also love that like throughout most of the match Brindley was still like had that exuberance about her um so they were a very good dichotomy between the two of them especially you know they their um ring attire was very telling of their personalities um but I thought this was great yeah and I hope they keep Reese and Ofe and Blade um together as a group uh you know a faction or whatever um because it would also be fun to see them going after things like tag titles and the North American title and things like that, where they're supporting each other. Um, 
they have similar scents like the wolf dogs but it's a little happier <laughs> um mm. but yeah I, I enjoyed it for what it was it was getting two people who were a little less experienced a little less shown on nxt to have some tv time have a match um it was not going to be an obvious squash because it's not like either of them were going up against someone who's just been wrestling for the title uh you know they're at the, about the same level um and uh you know it was fun and especially because they're both representing two different factions so again we could get some more faction action <laughs> i like to have that right <laughs> but i agree with you Jada, I love you, girl, but we got to pick it. We got to decide on a finisher and we got to make it look good. But also, Brinley, your song, your theme song is kind of generic EDM, but I'm kind of bopping along to the whole thing. And Idris and Malik, you keep doing you because I love you being paired with Brinley. Speaking of people being paired together, we go backstage and we see Ariana Grace and Sol Ruka, who is stealing Trey Miguel's look from his closet. <laughs> I was just like, yo, this is the beach. If this is the 2024 surfer girl aesthetic. Sign me up. I'm not going to lie. I was like, yo, this outfit's on fire. She'd be looking cute. Uh, Tyler Bate, you are a very lucky man. I'm jealous. Everybody's busting out the, the sexy, the nerdy look. Like, you know, <laughs> it's the glasses and the like casual wear that's you're seeing it pop up everywhere now. It It's fantastic. But I love this promo too because it starts off with Ariana Grace and Soul. Ariana's giving an update to Sol Ruka because Sol and Gigi, I guess, are friends. And Ariana is giving her an update of, like, Georgina and everything. And so then they talk about the announcement that Ava made at Stand and Deliver where Ariana Grace is like, what better way to usher in my reign as Miss NXT than to be your new <laughs> women's North American champion? And Sol's like, uh, hold up. You're not the only one who wants that. And I kind of want dibs. And I love the physical comedy of just like Ariana Grace and Soul were together when they were talking about this. And then she just slides out of frame. She's like, ew. And it's like, oh, hang on. Georgina is calling me. Georgina, girl, where are you? Which then prompts the second half of this. And Soul gets up and gets ready. Lola comes in. She's very upset with Natalia. She still looks a hot mess with her hair all over the place being pulled. And she's like, I'm going to la basura. She's going to take care of Natalia. And she's going to fight her. And Soul's like, uh, what do you expect? You attacked Natalia. So did you think she not was not going to hit you back? And Lola's like, so a lot has changed since you were here in the locker room. And so you better watch out. And Soul's like, uh, no. I was like, I don't know who you think you are, but uh, you're going to find out very soon. And I'm going to be honest, when we get the bumpers, this is the match I'm actually most excited to see. Lola versus... Soul, I'm like, please give these women some time because on paper, this is the match I'm the most excited for next week. Yeah, this, uh, obviously the three of them are probably going to be involved in whatever tournament or whatever we're going to get for the North American title. Um, and they can have some really great matches. Uh, I'm super excited to see Lola versus Soul because I've been super impressed with both of them, and they both have very different styles. Um, so it could be super, super interesting. I wonder if <clears throat> what we'll get from this is Natalia costing Lola the match against Soul to mm -hmm. then finally have a rematch or something there. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm excited too. Just like I was excited <laughs> for this next match, we had our tag team championship match, which was Nathan Frazier versus and Axiom versus the Wolf Dogs. We already knew who was winning this by the end of it, given with what happened in the night, but this match was still a lot of fun. Both teams went nuts. I still like the stand and deliver match better than what we saw here, but that's saying a lot because this was also fantastic. All right, so then, you know, it was a good run for the Wolf Dogs, but we had to say goodbye to them as champions because by the end of this, after almost running into each other, after Nathan and Axiom got out of the way and checking that they were okay, Nathan and Axiom hit their finisher. One, two, three. 
your winners and new NXT Tag Team Champions, Nathan Frazier and Axiom, a.k.a. Velocity. A moment of silence for the Wolf Dogs. I mean, hopefully it's not a moment of silence. Hopefully we get to see more of them. Um, but I will say that we... We only got a few matches from these two teams against each other. Um, together, they can do so many crazy things. I love watching these two work. I was worried in the beginning if it was going to be one of this like too soon to their last match, um, and if it was not going to live up to what their previous match did. Um, but as it started going, it really, really, I really enjoyed it and got even better and better as soon as they started really picking up their momentum. Um, I love the little part of Braun showing his speed on the ropes and taking out Axiom, and then Fraser came in and showed his speed by kind of outmaneuvering Braun. Um, that combo um, uh, slingshot, it was during the picture in picture, so you know some people may have missed it, but it was the uh, slingshot into a German suplex by Braun. Uh, um, it was just insane. Uh, the the height that Braun got on his jumping knee to Nathan Frazier, he almost jumped over Frazier. Um, and uh, it was it was just really good. Um, it is sad to see it happen this way. Um, obviously, they were setting it up so the Wolf Dogs could get that big win at Stand and Deliver. Um, yeah, um, it, was, it was a really good match. My biggest gripe is that this... And our other title match that were on this card had picture in picture in the middle of the match. The worst part was that in the women's match, the women's match was about, um, I think it was about eight minutes or so. Four minutes almost of that was spent picture in picture. So almost half the match was spent in picture in picture. Um, in total, I think we got eight minutes of picture in picture from both matches um, during title matches. And it was just like, uh, it just, it again felt like such bad programming. Uh, it bummed me out to miss some of the stuff that happened because we had some really good action that was happening during those times. Um, but when we came back, it was nice to see that uh, the, the two tag teams really picked it back up and gave us a really good finish. Um, so, yeah. So we have new champs, but they didn't get a chance to celebrate for long because who makes their appearance in NXT? But another main roster faction. So the final testament make their way down to the ring and attack, you know, Nathan and Axiom. So this is Karrion Cross, Scarlet, Paul Ellering, and the authors of Pain. They jump AOP jumps Nathan and Axiom. They hold, the final testament holds the titles up as the segment and match goes off the air. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, you mean to tell me that Bobby Lashley beat the and the pride defeated you know final testament so bad that they're back in NXT. I am alone in my island when I feel like I say this, but I like Karrion Cross. I don't hate him as some of our other folks here do. I just think he's been I don't think he's truly ever recovered from Adam Cole burying this man on the microphone during the black and gold era because he has not recovered ever since booking wise and everything. Because since that promo, he lost to Jeff Hardy when he was still NXT champion on main roster. He came dressed up looking like a gimp half the time in that stupid outfit. He got let go, came back, he got floundered, and we thought he was going to fight Roman Reigns at one point. Didn't happen. And he hasn't been booked very well. Then he gets this faction, which in theory I thought was going to be cool, but SmackDown also does not know how to book Karrion and his test and his group. Just and unfortunately, Bobby and the Street Profits got caught up in it too because nobody got booked well leading into that match in WrestleMania. But now they're in NXT, so. I had to explain to Will who these folks were because they are main roster folks. So I had to give him the details. He just gave me, he rolled his eyes. He's like, really? I was just like, I know, but it's going to be okay. Look, I like Carrion. I like AOP. I'm okay with Final Testament being down here in NXT, but it's also, it's like, I feel that they're only here until 
spring breaking is over. I feel this is where we're headed, that we're getting a tag match between AOP and Nathan and Axiom for spring breaking, and then everyone's going to go to their separate ways. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't hate if Final Testament was in NXT because I feel like bringing them in brings in a new challenge that could potentially give you a chance to rebook them and put them against some other people and some other groups, have them be a threat to somebody. Um, you know, obviously AOP is going after the new champs. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that um, Karen Cross could go after. Um, so I, I think there's a chance to do some stuff with them there. And realistically, if they're here just for spring break and just like Ivar, um, if Frazier and Axiom face them to defend their tag team titles, hopefully they come out victorious. Uh, that's two big, powerful tag teams that they've come off beating in their, you know, their reign as tag team champions. Um, so it could make that tag team look really good. Um, but it comes down to the booking, and hopefully they just do those things right. I hope so. But it seems that we're building up to this match, which, you know, we talked about spring break-in. This is where we get the official announcement, because this is the first time that spring break-in is going to be two whole weeks. So just like, just like Halloween Havoc, we get two weeks of spring break-in, which is going to be Tuesday, April 23rd, and Tuesday, April 30th. Which I find very funny because the first week of spring breaking is days before the first day of the WWE draft. And then the second week of spring breaking is the day after the draft has concluded. So things are going to get interesting from here. I'm excited. I really enjoyed Halloween Havoc this year. Or last year I should say. I thought it was fun. It was fantastic. Gold Rush over the summer was probably my favorite because all the championships were being defended across two weeks, which was nice. And then we even saw Braun and Seth go at it, which was also a very good match too. Which then leads us into our final thing for this episode. Mr. Trick Williams comes down. The audience is, you know, doing the ad libs along Booker T. Trick Williams, whoop that trick, comes down to the ring. Now, Trick. I love you, but I was like, I'm going to call shenanigans on the first couple of sentences in here. It's just like, I beat Carmella. I'm like, did we though? Did we? I was just like, we talked about it during the stand and deliver review. We're not going to rehash this here. But then we moved right into what I wanted him to because he talks about, I still got business with Ilya and I need to slay the mad dragon. So Ilya, I know you're back there. So come on out. So then Ilya comes out. Trick wants another shot at the NXT Championship. Him and Ilya go back and forth and have a playful nature. Trick asks Ilya for another shot, and Ilya says no. I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. I was just like, the heel turn begins. Just kidding. <laughs> but Ilya's like, no. There are other people who are in front of you. You had your chance at Vengeance Day. You lost the match, so you're not getting another shot at this. And which Trick tells Ilya, what do I have to do? Who do I have to fight? I'm willing to go to any lengths in order to make this happen. So Ilya thinks for a moment and tells Trick he can have his shot. They can have a championship match at spring break-in. However, there's a major stipulation to this. Should Trick lose this championship match, not only is it the final chance for Trick to get the championship, but Trick will have to leave NXT if he loses against Ilya. Which again, foretells me, it's like, oh, so Trick is going to be winning this match at Spring break -in. I was like, thanks for letting me know, NXT, but you know what? I'm I'm okay. I was like, I'm past that point. Still wish that this stipulation and match would have happened out of PLD for NXT, but you know, I'm not going to complain. But... Trick agrees. Ilya agrees. So second week of spring break-in, it is going to be Ilya versus Trick for the title, which makes me super excited. But then we had a party foul because Carmelo Hayes jumps both Trick and Ilya. Carmelo's getting booed. And basically, as the show goes off the air, Carmelo holds his title. He stands above Trick and, says like, and tells him, you ain't going to make it to spring break Nick, next. You're not going to make it to spring break-in. Because I'm going to beat your ass in a steel cage next week. 
So we're getting a steel cage match between Trick and Carmelo next week on NXT. And I'm excited. But I also thought as the show went off the air, I was like, couldn't we had that steel cage match at Stand and Deliver instead? I'm like, if this is where we were leading, you could have just had the steel cage at Stand and Deliver. Like, again, yeah. we talked about there needs to be finality. Next week's steel cage feels like the finality that we wanted at Stand and Deliver. Yeah, especially because it also seems pretty obvious that Trick is going to win that match too because he we already know he's going to a match against Ilya. Um, one of the things that made me laugh is Ilya's hand sure seemed to have healed very quickly. Um, ah, ah. <clears throat> um, and the draft is in two weeks, so I could see it going two ways of Trick winning and Ilya going off to the main roster, but you know, who knows? They, they could make a choice where Trick actually loses, and that's why he goes to the main roster. Um, my biggest issue with this promo stems from what we got throughout the whole night. I really wish everyone would stop talking about attendance and how big the shows are. Um, Trick came out and did the same thing. It was basically a part of every single promo that we got. Um, it felt like the company telling us about how exciting the times are because of the money the shareholders are making. Um, it, you know, it's fine to bring up your success and be proud of it, but stop bringing it up every single time. We've been talking about it since before Saturday about these are the ticket sales. These are the numbers. It's going to be the biggest show. It's going to do all this stuff. Like <clears throat> it happened. We saw it. That's fine. But <clears throat> the most exciting thing for me watching professional wrestling is not knowing how many people are attending live. Like, I don't, I don't care about that because the most exciting thing for me is the product. That's what I want to see. If I'm watching something that's really good professional wrestling and 50 other people are watching it, I'm in, I'm loving that. If I'm watching something that's okay or it's mediocre or it's even pretty good, but, 100,000 people, a million people, whatever are watching, that doesn't make it any better. Um, so them repeatedly telling us, it's just like a, look how successful we are. Look how, look how much money we made. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't change some of the problems that I've had with some of the product that we got. Um, and it just really takes away from the experience of watching the show when every promo had it in there it's like going to a place where like going to a store and really enjoying the store and the customer service and getting up to the register and then hearing them tell you about their their company's credit card that like would you like to sign up for and it's like i know you're doing this because your boss has told you i know you're doing this because you have to and i know it's part of their attempt to like get more loyalty or make more money or do any of these kind of things and it's like i don't want that i'm not here for that i had a nice experience coming to the store for what the store is i don't need that other stuff that's not going to make me want to come back here more um and that's kind of the way i felt about all of this so i hope now that we've kind of got past this going on as we're moving forward we're not going to get that at least from wrestlemania weekend obviously this is kind of the way that wwe and through N them nxt handles things so i know we'll get it once we come to the next big pay-per-view ple weekly special whatever's going to happen um but it just really took me away from a lot of what was happening this week <clears throat> yeah but that brings us to the end of this week's nxt so let's go into final ratings uh i will go first i think for an episode like this nxt after stand and deliver there's a lot of we're building towards spring breaking mm -hmm. which is going to be a really breakneck quick build for a lot of this because it's literally in about two weeks or so. Week one of spring break in is in two weeks or so. Gosh, Andrew, we got a lot ahead of us. We have Rebellion next weekend, and then we have the two weeks of spring break in to cover. But um, it's, I'm excited because this is going to be our first big two week special that we're all going to be reviewing as a trio because Halloween Havoc was just me and Will back in October. So I'm excited for this. Uh, I'm going to give this episode like a 7.5 out of 10 for me. I thought this was still a really solid show of NXT. 
there's obviously we're building up a lot of stuff to spring break in and i've come to accept that a lot of these two-week tv specials are going to involve some of our main roster talent which is i'm okay with if especially if it means we get some really fun matches i'm looking funny enough i'm looking forward to ivar and Obafemi. Cool. i think authors of pain versus nathan and axiom are actually going to be really good or whoever is going to represent final testament in that i'm interested to see I'm excited for Trick and Ilya. I'm interested to see who Roxanne's going to face. And, you know, even though there was some promo and backstage stuff, which was very heavy handed this episode, I thought I still enjoyed this. This is a solid show for me, so I give it a 7.5 out of 10. Nice. Um, I actually give it an 8. Um, Match-wise, there were some really awesome matches in here. Only one that I didn't really care for, and that was mostly for the storytelling aspect of things. Um, the promos were kind of hit and miss, um, but at least we're seeing some big things coming out of like the fallout of Stand and Deliver, which obviously, between the changing of titles or the not changing of titles, we now have to build up new stories for new contenders. Also, with the draft coming up, that's something else that's going to play a big factor into it, which also could mean that we're going to see some new faces. Um, people finally making their TV debuts in NXT or maybe some people returning to NXT. Um, but overall, I thought it was a really solid uh, night. Uh, the matches really carried it this week. Um, and um, I would really like to, I don't think this will happen, but... I would love to see them bring some credibility to NXT and have NXT maybe be a part of the draft in some way to where people could actually get drafted to NXT. Well, so it was said on Monday Night Raw, I'd be like, hi, I watch the Monday Night Raws too. <laughs> Monday Night Raw said that NXT would be a part of the draft, which means that you can get drafted from NXT to main roster, but it also was hinted that it would also work in reverse too cool. where potentially some main roster folks can be drafted to nxt and according to reports triple h wants nxt to go back to being a third brand in yes. addition to you know building up the new future stars for the company and honestly i would love to see back and forth our nxt kids going to main roster but i would like to see some established stars go to nxt and underneath Triple H, it d would feel very nice if you say it's not a demotion like it was underneath mm -hmm. the certain other person's regime for the last couple of years. Yeah. You go to NXT for main, and you're a main roster talent. It was seen as a demotion. But that's great. I love that. That's that's awesome. So I'm excited for that. And then of course, even though he was not here, Will did <laughs> send me his rating for this. Will gave this episode of NXT an 8 out of 10 as well. He thought that this was a really decent show. The matches, like you said, Andrew, the matches carried. Javon is now his boy, which I'm totally okay with because Javon Evans is great. The ladies were on fire tonight. Roxanne needs a little more mic practice. And Will wants me to make sure that everybody knows that he is still not a big fan of main roster stars coming to, over to NXT. Because Will is the big papa bear for our NXT kids. And he is very protective of them. But he is open to see what the matches bring for the two weeks of spring breaking. So we have reached the end of this week's DDT review. If you enjoyed this review, you can check out all the other stuff we have here on the BC WrestlePod YouTube channel. We have audio versions of all the reviews as well. So therefore... You can keep up with us video-wise and audio-wise, whatever floats your boat. No Natalia involved. Um, if you want to see more stuff, you can check us out on the social medias at BC WrestlePod where we get all the clips and things like that. And then, of course, if you want to see us live and in person, the East Coast Collective and myself will be hosting a table at New Jersey Wrestle Show Saturday, May 18th and Sunday, May 19th. So come say hi and check us out. Me and Andrew are going to go ogle at whatever Will dropped in our group chat. I know what it is because I've been privy to this information. But we're going to go and discuss what we are looking at currently. But from us here at DDT and the rest of BC WrestlePod, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, and as always, stay biconic and you deserve to finish your story. We will see you later. But until then, 
Ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Vibe Tribe production. What's going to happen next time? Well, you're going to have to tune in to find out. But until then, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, and as always, make sure that you keep the good times rolling. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time.